Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. The human experience is traversing the marketing troposphere, and we're speaking with viral marketing expert, professor, and author of the New York Times bestselling book, Contagious, Why Things Catch On, Dr. Jonah Berger. My co-host, Dr. G, is in the studio. Jonah, welcome to HXP. Thanks so much for having me. So, Jonah, if we could briefly go into your background, how did you find yourself in a position to be studying the effects of social currency and, and marketing? Well, uh, I grew up actually studying the hard sciences, math, uh, science, computer science, today what we might call STEM. Um, and I loved that way of understanding uh, why things happen. But I always wondered about humans. Why do we do the things that we do? Um, and I really got interested in the social sciences um, and uh, started to be interested in why things catch on, why products become popular, and why people behave the way they do. And I started a PhD and started doing research and uh, eventually was teaching a framework in my course that I thought would make a great book. Uh, to me, you know, there's a lot of uh, sort of gurus out there around social media. There's a lot of thoughts and theories, but there hasn't been a lot of data. The one thing that's really fun about Contagious is the first time where people are really bringing data to answer these questions. Right. I love I love the way that you say that word of mouth is the greatest form of advertising because I think I think that one of the things that I do the most is talk to other people. Why why do you say that? Why is word of mouth more important than advertising? I think there are two key reasons. The first very simply is trust. We trust our friends much more than we trust ads. We trust our colleagues much more than we trust ads. We know ads are trying to sell us something. So because of that, we sort of push back and we're not as persuaded. So the first benefit is trust. The second benefit is, is really targeting. Um, you know, the targeting benefit of word of mouth means that we only hear things from our friends and colleagues that we might be interested in. They don't tell us everything they could possibly tell us. They tell us the stuff we might find most relevant. Hey, so hey Jonah, it's Dr. G here. So I, I really enjoyed the book. It was super entertaining and I, I, you very rarely have a book that's as practical and entertaining. Um, one thing I wanted to kind of break down for the listeners is what is what exactly is social currency and who are the real heavy-hitting power brokers in this social currency or how do you become one? So the idea of social currency is very simple. Just like the car we drive or the clothes we wear, the things we say or the things we share, face-to-face word of mouth or the content we pass online affects how other people see us. So just like if someone drives a minivan, you might think they're a soccer mom, or someone, you know, wears certain clothes, you might think they're a hipster. Someone talks a lot about restaurants, you assume they're a foodie. Someone talks a lot about travel, you assume they're into that domain. What we talk about is a signal of who we are. And very simply, social currency is the idea that the more something lets us look good or signal a desired identity, the more likely we are to pass it on. Something makes us look smart or special, in the know, different from everybody else, we're, we're more likely to share it. And so uh, in the book, for example, I talk about a great example of a, a bar in New York City that's hidden inside a hot dog restaurant. Uh, you know, they don't advertise, they don't even have a sign up on the street, but people love talking about it when they go there because they look cool to their friends when they talk about having been to this place. It's a signal of being smart and in the know, but it's not just them. Think about simple things. You know, even uh, knowing a lot about a domain, you're not necessarily knowing secrets knowing uh, what happens in sports or, you know, uh, what happens in uh, athletics, what happens in uh, even recreational stuff, someone who's in the know, we're more likely to turn to them. So let's say we wanted to have something go viral by the end of this week. We had some kind of business or some kind of opportunity or video outside of, say, a world, you know, world star hip hop fight. Um, what would we have to do? What are some of the, the main things we have to, to expound upon in order to have something go viral? Yeah, so uh, we just talked about one of the factors that makes people share things. There are six in total, so there are a lot of different dimensions. Um, but, you know, I would say the first thing is to stop thinking it's random or luck and to stop focusing so much on the technology. You know, people love to jump on the bandwagon. What's the newest technology that's going on? And think more about the psychology. Not, well, I have a whole bunch of friends with followers on Facebook or Twitter, but why do people share in the first place? Really understanding that underlying human behavior 
And that's the first thing, and, and that's really what Contagious and the steps in it are all about. So what what makes something contagious? I mean, it's a million-dollar, billion-dollar question, but how does something become contagious itself? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned, there are those six factors. Social currency is one. Uh, triggers is the second. Emotion is the third. Public is the fourth. Practical value is the fifth. And stories are the sixth. Um, I put them in a contagious. I put them in a framework called STEPS. That's sort of an acronym that stands for those six things. And each of them is a driver of why people share it. So we just talked about social currency. People talk about things that make them look good. Um, emotion is another big one. Uh, you know, the more emotionally connected we are, the more we care about something, the more likely we are to share. But it's actually not all emotions that drive sharing. It's really about emotions that activate us to pass something on. So on the positive side, for example, emotions like excitement or humor are activating emotions, whereas contentment is a more deactivating emotion. On the negative side, anger and arousal are much more activating than sadness. And so when we feel these activating emotions, when content makes us feel them, when we feel angry, uh, or even when we feel angry for an unrelated reason, these high arousal emotions can drive us to share. How would you, how would you define something that goes viral? Yeah, so I actually don't think that the idea of viral itself is really interesting. I think there's a lot of hype around it, uh, but there's no you know, one cutoff when something goes viral. It's not like going viral is a million views and 900,000 views is not. Um, and actually, even if you think about it, views is a bad measure. Views measures how many times something has been seen. It doesn't matter how many people see it or if those people actually shared it. Um, and so a lot of what you know, I help companies do is think about the right metrics. When we talk about viral, we need people. So a lot of people who come in contact with it actually pass it on. Um, and so really, I think a better measure is to think about what I call the share rate or the shares per view. Out of 100 people that see a piece of content, do people share it? That content may not even be that popular. It may not have millions and millions of views, but that's still valuable for the companies or individuals that created it if they can get that share rate higher. And so while viral encourages us to focus on flashes in the pan, things that are here today and gone tomorrow. So like, what does the Fox say, for example? Really funny when that came out a couple of years ago, got a few hundred million views. We haven't ever heard from them again. I don't think those guys are doing very much today. And so whether you're a brand trying to get your products or ideas to catch on, or you're just a person trying to get your personal brand to catch on at work or get your message out there, you don't need 100 million views, right? You don't need 10 million or 20 million views. You want more people to share your ideas. And right. so that's really what these steps are all about. It's getting that batting average up and getting people who are more likely to share, whether they share with 10 people or whether they share with 100 so it seems to me that the way business is, the way the business economy is working right now is you pretty much have to showcase that you're an expert in something or have some kind of adept uh, knowledge at a particular subject. But how does one go about doing that without looking like a complete braggart prick in the process? Because I know that the intention can make a huge difference, but what are some things that someone can do, say, in a professional capacity to ensure that that doesn't happen? I think there's a difference between bragging and sharing useful information. So, um, for example, you think about what content marketing is uh, and when brands do content marketing, it's really sharing useful information that's not about them. Like, hey, hey, look at me, follow me, pay attention to me, but giving someone else something. Right? It's not talking about you, it's talking about the information. And I think the more we can give others useful information, want to build expertise in the space, don't say, hey, I'm an expert, hey, I'm great at this. Give someone something that shows you're an expert. And that's one thing I really talk a lot about in the book, this idea of showing rather than telling. I think too often we think to get a message across, we need to tell people, hey, you know, uh, I'm an expert on this. Well, let me tell you how great I am. But rather than telling people how great you are, why don't you show them by giving them useful information or something that helps their lives out that they'll want to pass on to others, and along the way they'll remember you in the process. And so this, if you give this... them something useful and they share it with someone else, they'll definitely see you more as an expert than they would otherwise. This is the, the practical value that you mentioned in the book. Is that, is that what you're referring to right now? Definitely. Both the practical value and the idea of building a Trojan horse story, right? Rather making yourself part of a message rather than just giving information. I really liked your Trojan horse concept, and I, I did read your book. And there's, Can you go into that a little bit more? How does someone build a Trojan horse story? Yes. Um, uh, take, for example, a, a statistic. Uh, you know, many people think that most word of mouth is online, uh, but it actually turns out that only about 7% of all word of mouth is online. Most word of mouth is offline. Now, that's a really surprising statistic. I often quote that statistic when I give talks and I mention it in the book. 
that's useful information for people working in the word of mouth space. But one thing you want to make sure is, well, when I'm sharing useful information or I'm telling a story, how do I make sure I come along for the ride, that I'm part of that story or my message is, is part of that story? There's a great example I use in a book uh, from a company called Blendtec. They make these great videos called Will It Blend, where they stick everything from an iPhone to marble, anything you can imagine in a blender. So literally imagine a marble getting caught up in a blender and watching them get in cut to shreds. It's an amazing piece of content. You can't help but watch it and, and be impressed and feel those emotions. But it's not just that. At the end of the day, when you're watching that video, you can't help but realize that, wow, they make a really tough blender. And so it's not just a great story or a great piece of content. It brings their attribute along for the ride. And, and the reason I like the phrase the Trojan horse story, if you think about a Trojan horse, it's a, a carrier or a vessel. In a Trojan horse case, it brought men inside. But stories do the same thing. They carry message or ideas with them. You think about the boy who cried wolf. I mean, it encourages people not to lie. It's a story, a Trojan horse story, that, that carries an underlying message. Mm, right. So then how would, how would uh, a grassroots, someone who doesn't necessarily have the money to spend on an advertising campaign. How would someone build a, a, a Trojan horse type story around a product that they have? Or how, what would you suggest to someone who wants to succeed marketing their product? I, mean, I think the first thing is to understand your, your customer base or your users. You know, what in particular are they interested in? And how can you create a story that appeals to their interests? When we think about building that story, those high arousal emotions I talked about, that idea of social currency, stories that uh, surprise people or even make people angry or excited will encourage people to share. But then make sure at the end of the day that the moral of that story has either something to do with you, your brand, your product, or the attribute you care about. Too often, companies create content, particularly now with the web and social media. You know, everyone's trying to be a content creator. Everyone wants to try to create amazing, engaging content. But at the end of the day, if someone watches or engages with your content, but they can't remember who it's for, it's not going to be very useful. And so I talk about this idea of valuable morality. We don't only want someone to share something. We want to make sure it's valuable for the person that creates it. So how can the moral of the story that you create be that your brand is very trustworthy? If trust is the attribute you care about, we'll build the story that shows how trustworthy you are. It's an engaging story, but at the end of the day, that idea of trust comes along for the ride. So let's get, let's get practical for a moment and kind of do a case study, um, so to speak, for our listeners. So Jonah, take our, take our podcast, for instance. What you just mentioned, what are some things we could do to kind of maximize the chances of, say, virality of what we're kind of doing here at Human Experience? Okay. Well, so I, I need some better sense of sort of what a factoid would be, a piece of information or a story. So, for example, what's the story of someone who listened to your podcast um, that did something amazing with that information? If one of our shows really helped someone figure something out or change their change their life in some way, like for example, I got an email from someone in the military who was suffering from PTSD. They heard one of our episodes. The episode really helped them decide how to treat their PTSD through listening to us talk about it. Neat. And so I think that's a, a good place to start. I might, if you know, we were working together, I might encourage you to dig into some of the details of that story. So the more concrete we make them, the more we tell about the person, for example, who was this specific person, how did they get the disorder, um, some concrete details about their life helps us get a sense of who that person is and, and a more emotionally engaged with them as a character. But then I think that story, as you talked about, is a great example of the power of your podcast. Right now, we need to think about how to make that story engaging, particularly emotional, but it sounds like the story itself is a good Trojan force for the message you're trying to get out there. This podcast can change people's lives for the better. Um, and so it's really thinking about, you know, one, what's an engaging story, but two, what is an engaging story that at the end of it, as a moral, shows the product or idea that you're trying to get people excited about. Right. So it sounds like, sounds like emotional triggers is what you're kind of harping on here. So what's the secret of getting people to care enough to share the content emotionally? Or what are some of these uh, stratifications that you mentioned as far as these benchmarks for you positive and negative triggers that you mentioned in the book? Can you kind of talk about that? Yeah, and, and emotion and trigger are two things that are, that are different. So emotion is really how much we feel connected to something. Uh, we can talk about emotions like anger, anxiety, or excitement, uh, humor, inspiration. Inspiration, for example, in the story we just talked about, the more inspired people are uh, to see things that others have accomplished or achieved or even how much someone has overcome something, 
an inspiration or awe is a high arousal emotion that drives people to share. But triggers are a little different. So um, triggers are about whether or not you remember to think about something. Are you triggered to think about it or trigger it to, to mention uh, that idea to someone else? And I think too often, you know, we think about, well, how much does someone like us or how much does someone like our product or our idea? But if someone likes us but they never think about us, it doesn't matter very much. So take a, a great example. There's um, a video floating around recently from the company Geico, uh, and they have a great ad with a camel in it uh, where he's walking around the office going, what day is it today? What day is it? He finds out it's hump day. He gets very excited, and the ad says something along the lines of, you know, how happy are people save money with Geico? Happier than a camel on hump day. Now, that ad is sort of funny. It has a little bit of emotion, but it actually doesn't have that much emotion. So what's interesting about it is that's the second most shared ad of last year, of all ads, period. Not just of uh, insurance ads, but any ad at all. And so you could say, well, if it's not that funny, and if they didn't spend that much money advertising it, why did it do so well? So if you look at the data, if you dig a little deeper, you see an interesting pattern. There's a spike in shares, and then it goes down, and then another spike, and then it goes down, and another spike, and then it goes down. And if you look closer, those spikes aren't random. They're seven days apart. If you look even closer, you'll notice they're at every Wednesday, or as it's colloquially known, hump day. And so that content is equally emotional every day of the week, right? It's emotional on Monday, it's emotional on Tuesday, emotional on Wednesday. But Wednesday rolls around and it provides a ready reminder or a trigger, a sort of thing in people's minds to encourage them to think about it and share that information. Because if something's top of mind, it's much more likely to be tip of tongue. And so one thing I encourage people to think about is what can you link yourself to in the environment such that every time people see that thing, or hear that thing, they think of you. If I said peanut butter and, for example, what, what word might you think of? Uh, just jelly, right? Peanut butter and jelly? Yeah. Right, or if I said rum and, what, what word might you Rum and Coke. You might think of alcohol, and you also might think of Coke, right? Rum and Coke. And so the idea here is, you know, peanut butter makes people think about jelly, even if jelly's not around. It's almost like jelly should pay peanut butter a kickback or a referral fee every time Peter goes around, because it makes people think about jelly. And that's what we call a trigger. And so, you know, when people want to be thought of more, they want their ideas to be thought of more, I say, well, what's your peanut butter? So, Jonah, can we just, can we, can we get into, I mean, your story's pretty interesting because you, you, you know, you, you did your PhD and, and then you were kind of teaching and now you have this New York Times bestseller. What is something that you think you did differently than maybe other authors that put you in this sort of sphere of succeeding. Yeah, and I think there are some, some things from this book per se, and then there's some more general stuff. For the book, you know, we really relied on the ideas from the book to market the book. For triggers, we created some tissues that are orange. The book came out during cold and flu season. We wanted every time people were sneezing to think about the book and to think about ideas being spread, just like diseases are spread. We came out with some orange tissues that I would give out um, during talks that said, don't you wish your ideas are this contagious? And I, I hope that, you know, a few thousand, hundred thousand copies in print in 35 languages around the world shows that, you know, we're doing okay. We haven't nailed it, but we've learned something. More generally, though, you know, I think one important thing is just to find something you love doing. You know, I would be excited about this book and the ideas in this book, even if it sold 10 copies. Um, I'm just really proud of the research and really excited to be able to share it with people. And so if you find something you love doing, you know, that old phrase, do what you love and love what you do, and you keep persisting at it, you can't help but, but be somewhat successful. Right. So passion is definitely one of those motiv motivating factors. That's huge. I think that's really ingenious what you did to advertise and market the book. What are some, just, what are some obstacles you guys have seen uh, as far as people implementing these steps and what changes? The, the marketplace is changing so rapidly and technology is constantly advancing what do you anticipate on the horizon with these advances in technology and how can someone adapt accordingly? Yeah, you know, people love to say that technology is changing, and it is, but most word of mouth is offline. Most word of mouth is still face-to-face. -face. The, the original social media uh, is face-to-face -face word of mouth. And, you know, it's really easy to jump on the bandwagon and, you know, whether it's Pinterest or Instagram or all these different technologies that may come and go, you know, people thought Foursquare was going to be really big, and then it wasn't. And so rather than focusing so much on the technology, think more about, you know, behavior, what drives that behavior, and how you can take advantage of it. You know, if you think only one thing from these ideas, it's how do you turn customers into advocates? How do you turn people that like you and get them to talk and share your ideas, your products, your message, 
even your, your, your movement, help it become even bigger. You don't have to involve technology, though technology can help. It doesn't have to be online. It's really simply about how do you build support for something by getting one person to tell just one other person about it. And even if you've got a small business, you know, you're just, you're just starting out, there are a couple of customers that like you. Figure out why they like you. Give them really good service. You know, show them that personal attention, and they'll be more likely to talk about you with others. Make them feel special. Too often, I think, as business owners, we focus on ourselves. We say, well, let me, let me show you how great I am. How can you make your customers look really good? You know, make your customers feel special. Make them look good to others. They'll tell everybody else because they want to get that social currency. And so it's less about technology and, and more about psychology. Yeah. Yeah. Jonah, I know, I know your time is limited, man. If we could just cover homophily the love of the same thing that you kind of go into in the book, uh, that, would, that would wrap things up well, I think. Perfect. Yeah. I think that's sort of a really interesting thing. You know, we all think we're very different from those around us, and we are a little, um, but there's this old, old idea in, in sociology called homophily, which basically means that people tend to be friends with other people like them. And there are two key reasons for that. One, we tend to hang out with other people that do the same things that we do. If you like movies, you tend to go to the movies a lot, and you meet other people at movies. If you play basketball rather than golf, you tend to meet more basketball players than golfers. And so we tend to meet other people that have similar interests. But even within that, we tend to become friends with those folks among the set of folks we meet that are more like us. And so altogether, this ends up meaning that we're friends with others like us, which is good news for word of mouth. Because if you're a small business or an entrepreneur and someone likes you, it's likely their friends will like to talk to offer as well. Very true. Jonah, where can, where can people find your work? How can people get to your stuff? Yeah, so uh, first of all, the, the book is Contagious, Why Things Catch On. It's on Amazon as well as uh, any other online retailer and, and major booksellers. You can also find me uh, at Jonah, J-O-N-A-H, Berger, B-E-R-G-E-R dot com. Um, there's a free workbook there on the resource tab in case people are interested in applying these ideas. It's just, uh, I think, the rightmost tab on the, the set of buttons. It'll help you download a workbook to think about how to apply these ideas. And then last but not least, if you like the social media stuff and you want to chat with me there, uh, people can find me at J1 Burger on Twitter. Very, very cool. Jonah, thanks so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. Really intriguing work. I know you're a busy guy, so we're going to let you go. This is The Human Experience. My co-host, Dr. G. I'm Xavier. We're out of here. Thanks so much for listening. We will see you guys next week. <laughs>